voracious appetite for energy. It actually consumes as much uh, a much higher proportion of fuel by weight than most of your or other organs. It only accounts for about 2% of your body weight, about 1 50th of your body weight, but at rest, it actually accounts for nearly 20% or one fifth of your whole body energy use. So energy metabolism is just it's extremely important in your brain. So what is that energy used for in your brain? Well, the majority of energy in your brain goes towards actual firing of your neurons, and that's needed to transmit signals between your brain cells. But the last third of your energy in your brain goes towards other processes called housekeeping processes that are needed to just maintain the integrity of your system. So this also includes processes such as responding to stress, repairing damage, and just keeping your systems running smoothly, much like a housekeeper in your hotel. So there's every time, every single time a neuron fires, every single time you need to build a protein, all of these things require energy. Okay. Sorry, there we go. Okay, so part of our hypothesis is that as you age, your cells are exposed to more stress and more repair is needed. So living in the Midwest, we are accustomed to storms and occasionally um, we have to deal with storm damage. So I'm sure many of you have dealt with shingles missing on your roof when you have a really strong wind. Um, if you don't repair that damage from a storm, then it can cause bigger issues. So you can have issues actually inside of your house as well as outside. Um, and if you don't, and this is demonstrated here, if you don't have money to fix the damage, it can obviously lead to these bigger problems. So in a similar manner, you can envision that energy in your cells can be used like molecular money. You need it to fix issues that are cropping up in your cells due to storms that you encounter in your own health. So just like if you don't have money to fix your roof, if you don't have energy to fix and repair um, things that are happening in your brain cells or to contribute to proper housekeeping, we hypothesize that this contributes to impaired proteostasis or protein folding and accumulation of these plaques and tangles that we know are the neuropathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Now, it's still not understood if energy metabolism is upstream or downstream of these protein folding issues, but nonetheless, it is a clear contributor to brain health, and we tend to think of it as more upstream. So the study of energy metabolism is really at the very root of my research program and that of many of my colleagues at the KU Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Um, you can kind of think of, of your brain as a car, just like a car has multiple parts that all play a key role in its function. Um, your body also has key parts that play a role in the generation of energy and its use. So in your car, you need fuel, you need intact fuel lines, and you need a, an engine that works in order for your car to drive. Any of these um, issues with any of those particular components can cause you to not be able to drive your car. Well, the same thing is true with your brain. Um, you need fuel, and I'll talk about fuel in a minute for your brain, but you also need a good vascular system, um, and you also need an intact engine. And mitochondria are organelles in the body that are sort of the engines of cells that you can actually use. That's where um, ATP is actually generated in the body. But you have to have fuel, you have to be able to get it there, and then you have to be able to generate the energy. So this is why cardiovascular disease and diabetes are risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and why we're so interested in sort of understanding this. Um, so yeah, our work really just focuses on targeting these particular systems to improve brain health. So I put this slide on here because um, <laughs> it's not always clear when I talk about brain fuel, what exactly that, that means. Um, and despite a great need for energy, your brain really doesn't have that much of an energy reserve stored away for when it needs it. So unlike your muscles and other organs, which can store excess carbohydrates, your brain brain needs to be constantly supplied with energy and oxygen in order to run properly. So if your blood supply to the brain is cut off or disrupted, like during a stroke or a head injury, neurons can start shutting down pretty quickly. Um, this may seem like a flaw, but it's actually really critical to brain function um, because if our cells contain, if our brains contain cells that stored back backup power. This would actually take up more space between neurons and increase the length that, that your electrical signals would have to travel and that would require even more energy. So our brains are really designed to be very efficient, although this comes at a cost, especially in times of emergencies or accidents. But the brain, the main fuel of the brain is glucose or blood sugar. 
and it can go into the brain um, quite readily, but lactate and ketones can also readily be used by the brain. And I'm gonna be focusing primarily on glucose and lactate during this presentation. So glucose is blood sugar. Um, and it's the primary fuel for the brain. So it's actually taken up primarily into sort of helper cells or glial cells rather than neurons themselves. So I drew this little drawing here. You can see the glial cells and your neurons that you typically think of as brain cells. We actually can measure <clears throat> this uptake using neuroimaging um, with something called an FDG PET scan. So when we measure, uh, when we use an FDG PET scan, we call that glucose metabolism. And we, that's actually measuring the glucose coming out of your blood into primarily glial cells. But you can think of these glial cells as the support cells for neurons, sort of like mama birds, um, and the neurons are sort of baby birds, in that they actually break down the glucose into lactate and then give the lactate to neurons, which is a more readily digested form of energy. Um, so much like the mama birds partially digest you know, worms for their babies, glial cells partially digest glucose into lactate for neurons. But neurons can actually um, take up lactate directly from the blood as well which is shown here. Um, and that's actually a really important and understudied component of brain aging. We actually think that one reason that exercise is good for the brain is that it increases the amount of lactate that is available to go into neurons. And as you can see, um, this is the FDG PET signal. So that signal of brain glucose metabolism, glucose uptake. And it actually drops during the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a PET scan, what it should look like. And then this is someone who has um, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. So the red areas are where there's a lot of glucose uptake going on. And then as you can see, that is lost um, in, as the disease progresses. So during this time, it's thought that it might be more important for other fuels like lactate or ketones to become more important and meet the brain's energy needs. And I'm going to kind of get at that um, in a moment. But just to change gears for just a second, this is sort of bringing us to exercise because exercise is a way that we know that we can actually increase blood lactate levels. So exercise has well-characterized physiological benefits. It helps with um, you know, cardiovascular disease. It just helps with general health and mobility. But observational work has also shown that Fitness has um, fitness, which comes from exercise, has positive impacts that extend to the brain. So we've done quite a few studies now looking at this, and I'm sure many of you who have followed our programs know many of the studies that I'm going to mention, but we know that um, increasing whole body fitness is associated with higher levels of hippocampal volume, and that's that um, main brain region that's really important for memory in people with Alzheimer's disease. We've shown that risk factors um, for Alzheimer's disease, such as increasing age, female sex, um, and then APOE4 genotype, all are um, associated with lower cardiovascular fitness. And then we know that fitness is also associated with brain volume and then longitudinal changes in brain volume. So we're very interested in, in mechanisms and how this occurred. So, um, just really briefly, several years ago during my postdoc fellowship, an exercise trial led by Jeff Burns called TEAM really demonstrated this relationship between fitness and cognitive function. So our group basically just demonstrated that increasing doses of exercise, as you can see um, in the red bars, as you go from no change in physical activity to increasing amounts of exercise per week, actually improved specific aspects of thinking and that any dose of exercise was actually improve, um, enough to improve tests of attention. That's shown in the green bars. So we saw really good target engagement over six months. Um, cognitively healthy older adults really improved their fitness significantly. Um, they ranged from an improvement of 6% to 12% based on how much exercise they were doing. And <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, cognitive improvements were mediated by that improvement in fitness. We did something similar in a sister study. Um, the teen study took place in older adults, but this study at depth um, took place in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So here we found that just being in the aerobic exercise group improved the functional ability of individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And this is really how well they were able to perform activities of daily living. Um, such as, you know, getting around the house, being able to care for themselves. But there was no group difference in memory performance. So if you look over here, um, these people were basically able to maintain their 
um, activities of daily living. Were, and the red is where we would have expected them to be after six months. So they would be declining. The um, control group actually did decline over that amount of time. Um, but secondary analyses revealed that people who improved their fitness, which is this blue line, um, did improve their memory the most, suggesting again that something about this cardiorespiratory fitness change was really important to memory function. And we also saw something similar when we looked at hippocampal volume, which is again that part of the brain that's really key to memory. So really stemming from these two studies, um, that implicated increased fitness was associated with improved brain outcomes, we became interested in the mechanisms um, of what was related to fitness improvement and what is driving benefit. We really wanted to figure out how to better intervene in our studies, and we think that acute changes in blood lactate during exercise, as well as some other components, may be key to brain benefits with exercise. So I get a lot of questions about lactate and if that's related to lactose. So I just wanted to put this slide in here to clarify that because it can be really confusing. So lactate, we know, um, increases acutely with exercise and it's not related to milk. It's actually produced during the breakdown of blood sugar. And it's very essential for cellular processes, including uh, regenerating some coenzymes that are needed for glycolysis or metabolism to continue. Um, and you might've heard of like lactase and lactose, and those are um, types of sugars present in milk, but they're not really what I'm referring to here. So um, in addition, many of you have probably heard of lactic acid, and that is often blamed for that burning or soreness that you get following intense exercise. But in reality, lactic acid, we know now doesn't really exist physiologically in the body. Lactate itself is actually a weak base, and those burning effects are really due to the generation of hydrogen ions during the breakdown of ATP and glycolysis. All that to say is that lactate can actually act as a buffer to help with this. Um, lactate is an important signaling hormone. It's been linked to inducing uh, BDNF expression, which is, uh, I'll talk about it a little later, sort of like a brain vitamin, as well as modulation of blood flow to your brain. So if you think back to those fuel pipes that I mentioned earlier, earlier. <clears throat> of course, it can also be used as a fuel. And lactate can spare glucose and allow it to be used in other pathways, like regeneration of glutathione, which is used to um, help deal with oxidative stress and free radicals that can also cause damage in the brain. So during exercise, we know that the um, brain actually switches to a net uptake of lactate because there's a lot of it in the periphery and it can actually more readily use lactate than glucose. Nearly all lactate that's taken up to the brain is oxidized and used to make energy. So um, <clears throat> we know that lactate increases with exercise, and we know that more strenuous exercise is associated with greater increases in lactate. We recently finished some biomarker characterization on a study called Dynamic um, that many of you might have been familiar with or, or maybe even participated in. Um, but that was looking at acute exercise and brain blood flow. So as we expected, we saw substantial increases in lactate after about 20 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, and they were sustained for about an hour post-exercise. So you can see here, you get a really big boost and it's high after exercise and then kind of goes back down as your cells take it up and clear it. But what's really interesting is that lactate is known to cross the blood-brain barrier and induce the production of EDNF, and that is that brain vitamin that I talked about earlier. It's um, a... It's a a, not a hormone, I'm sorry, it's a molecule that is known to facilitate growth and survival of your brain cells. So um, this is just a little bit more data from that study of acute exercise showing that this study was done in um, cognitively healthy older adults, the mean age was about 72. And in the study, individuals exercised, they had a five minute warm up, 15 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. And then we took a couple um, a, a couple blood draws after that. And you can see that the production, or, or not the production, the release of BDNF continues to increase after exercise is over. So you know that the increase in lactate kind of went up and came back down, but the release of BDNF continued to increase after exercise was over. And we just didn't take any more blood draws after that. So we're not really sure how long this would continue to go up. So that is interesting. You know, lactate goes up and comes back down. BDNF keeps going up. Why is that? Well, we know that lactate actually increases BDNF production, 
but not actually storage. So what, what's happening is that your, um, your body is basically releasing stored BDNF. And um, BDNF is known to be uh, stored in platelets in your blood. And so what's happening is that this is showing, uh, this PF4 AUC is actually looking at activation of platelets. Um, basically, as people exercise, their platelet activation is going up and the, the platelets are actually spewing out BDNF that they have stored inside of them. So sheer stress can actually cause this to happen. And that's probably going to be due to increased um, blood flow during exercise. So the increased blood flow is really causing the activation of platelets and the release of BDNF, which is all really good. So this sort of brings me to another study that we're doing right now. And this study is still enrolling, but it's almost done. Um, it's called aerobic, and it stands for Acute Exercise Response on Brain Imaging and Cognition. So some people benefit a lot from exercise trials and others benefit less. And we think that this difference is due in part to their um, differences in physiological responses to each single bout of acute exercise. So every time you exercise, this happens, you know, your, bl your blood flow increases, your lactate goes up, your BDNF increases, but the amount that all of this occurs might be different between individuals due to different factors, maybe exercise intensity or just factors unique to that individual that we're trying to understand more readily. Um, we, we don't fully understand how brain glucose metabolism changes with exercise and if this differs between people who are cognitively healthy and people who are struggling with memory and thinking. But better understanding of this is really going to help us understand more how to intervene, whether we need to prescribe different exercise intensities or modalities or different to different groups of people, for instance. So in this study, Essentially, um, we do some screening. There's four visits. One of them is an exercise test. We do that to make sure that the person's safe to exercise and we know how much to how much exercise to prescribe to them. And then there's two counterbalanced identical visits, one with exercise and one that's completely at rest. And these are identical except for that part, the actual exercise. And then, there, then there's an MRI scan at the end. So essentially, we're looking at brain glucose metabolism as our primary outcome. And then we're looking at change in lactate and BDNF, those molecules that I was just talking about before. So this is showing our setup here. We have, um, this is the PET scanner where we me measure brain glucose metabolism and we have people exercise right there in the same room with the PET scanner. Um, so the crux of this study, again, comes from those comparisons of the brain PET scans and the resting versus the exercise state. And then we randomize participants into either a moderate or higher intensity exercise and um, we, we basically compare those scans. We also compare cognitive for performance. We have a little iPad that has some, some essentially brain exercises on it. So we can compare that between the exercise and resting conditions. So yeah, we have like moderate or a little higher intensity exercise. That's pretty much all I have for today. Um, in summary, energy metabolism is critically important to the brain. We think that it plays an early role in the development of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. We're really interested in understanding the etiology or the cause of these diseases, but we also want to know how to better intervene and slow the diseases. So we're working on gaining a better understanding of some of these mechanisms by which our lifestyle interventions work. And when we understand mechanisms, we can actually get a little bit better understanding of how to actually design drug trials and things like that as well.